B-Sides DC would like to thank all of our sponsors, and a special thank you to all of our speakers, volunteers, and organizers. Good morning, everybody. Uh, and yeah, I'm going to be talking about um, just some ideas about uh, new, new challenge problems, new directions for uh, meaningful software reverse engineering AI research. Um, so imagine, I want you to take a second and imagine, uh, you know, hopefully I'm, I'm guessing if you're here versus one of the other talks, you're, you're familiar with software reverse engineering or, um, you know, at, at least on a surface level. And uh, so imagine, take a moment to imagine if software RE could be faster, uh, more effective, and accessible to a broader, to a broader uh, scope of people with different experiences, um, different training levels. Imagine if, if you're a software reverse engineer, um, how many software reverse engineers that you, in, in the audience that you do some software reverse engineering in your job? Show of hands. Okay. Smattering. Okay. Uh, how about folks that work with software reverse engineers or you, you have software reverse engineers as part of your operation in your job? Okay, some, some more. So some, famili some familiarity there, that's good. So if, if for the software reverse engineers, imagine that you're working, you have a tool that when you load up a new binary and you're, you know, your disassemble it, disassembly tool or your, you know, your software tool, you, you, have, uh, you automatically get meaningful descriptive labels of the code that you're looking at uh, in easy to read text. Um, imagine that when you load up a new binary that you're going to analyze and reverse, you get a well-labeled software architecture diagram. So not just descriptions of each module, but also well-labeled you know, flows and connections between each module. Uh, it sounds kind of, uh, sounds kind of far-fetched, sounds kind of crazy, but um, that's what I'm going to talk about today. Imagine for the, for, for, the, for the rest of us, imagine that you are able to, um, imagine that you get, a, you have a tool that is able to meaningfully describe to you in natural language, you know, what a piece of software is doing, how it works, um, and you know, it, it's actually work, it, the thing actually works and it's, Reliable. Imagine what kind, how that could change uh, InfoSec. Um, so that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to be talking about in in software reverse engineering, what problems I think we should be we should consider solve problems. That's from a research perspective. You know, from a research perspective, a solve problem is one that has been reduced to practice for a for a given scope. Um, I'm going to go quickly through, through that. Uh, the gaps between sort of the solved problems in reverse engineering and the existing software reverse engineering process, and then hopefully that motivates what problems to work on next and talk a little bit about how to get started on those things. Um, so just a, a quick bit of background. So at APL, the reverse engineering research that we do, um, it's the, the work that I'm involved in is, uh, is vulnerability analysis for embedded systems. So regularly what happens is we, we sort of have like a trusted agent or evalu evaluator role for the government. So the government will bring us a, you know, a military system that's designed by a contractor, a group of contractors, and say, evaluate this. Does it have any vulnerabilities in it? Uh, you know, and usually it's kind of a mix of contractor designed commercial parts and you know they'll say hey does it have any vulnerabilities and the, the best one is when they say you know sometimes it's we're about to put this on a ship you know the best one is you know hey this is already out there on the ship and does it have any you know vulnerabilities in it um, so that's kind of the world that we that we play in it's a little bit different from you know say a day-to-day -day, um, you know network defense or uh, you know malware kind of kind of re, and it's also it's also a little bit different from um, you know from reverse engineering uh, vulnerability analysis on you know on PCs or, or, or phones. Um, 
we're often in kind of the bare metal or RTOS world. Um, and because of that, because of working with uh, complex systems and um, these embedded systems where we don't get a lot of debugger access, um, you know, it's, it's sometimes hard to hook up to get, um, to get like traces or things like that. Um, you know, that, that kind of motivates our, our thinking. We end up having to do a lot of our analysis in static analysis, right, where we're, where we're just like staring at code. We're like, we're, we're the, the, the folks that stare at code. That's, that's kind of what we do. Um, so I think, we, I think that gives us a, kind of a, a little bit of a unique perspective into some of the hardest challenges in, um, in software reverse engineering, uh, especially static analysis. Um, okay, so quickly, you know, what problems in reverse engineering should we consider solved? There's been a lot of research out there, um, a lot of university research, and um, part of this talk, what, what, you know, why I'm giving this is I'm, I'm hoping that if there are, you know, if there's students in the audience, there's folks that are, uh, you know, either in, involved in research in your, you know, in your company, or, um, you know, you're, you're a student, you're, maybe you're currently a student, maybe you're thinking about adding on a degree, that you'll think about this kind of um, research, and this might be something that you choose to pick up um, you know, in, in, that, um, in those pursuits. Um, so anyway, what, what should we consider solved? Um, I will argue, there's, there's been a lot of different, if you look through the research um, coming out of lots, you know, different universities, there's a lot of things in, um, that, that have been done in static analysis, but the, the main things, um, you know, over the past decade or so, the main things that are the most useful um, that have come out of, out of research is decompilation and function to fun function matching. And so I'll talk about that kind of quickly. I mentioned here, there's also a lot of work in combined static and dynamic analysis approach approaches. So that's the kind of thing where you have your static disassembly of the code and you also have, you know, the ability to hook up a debugger and capture trace information and then you kind of, you know, mesh that data together to make sense of what's happening. Since we don't do that a lot, I'm not in a really good position to kind of evaluate the state of those tools, so I'm just going to sort of um, punt on that and focus on the other two. Um, quickly, so if you're not familiar, decompilation is the idea of taking binary code, which most of the time in the, in the embedded world, we're working with C and C++, you know, uh, what started out as C and C++ source code, and decompilation is taking the binaries and translating it back to, you know, a C code or, or a C-like form. Um, as of a couple of years ago, there wasn't much out there, and, and there, 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 um, there wasn't much out there that was free. Um, so now you can see across the top, Ida Pro, Ghidra, RetDeck, Relic, Anger Management, and Jeb are all out there. Jeb and Ida Pro are the uh, ones that cost money. Um, but now, especially with Ghidra um, being, being released this past year, um, there, Ghidra now is basically a fully featured decompiler that works for every architecture that Ghidra supports. Um, so that's pretty awesome. And, and open source, available to anybody for research. So that, that's kind of a, a big deal. Um, Decompilers, they all sort of work the same way. Um, it all, all of it traces back to a researcher named uh, Christina Sofuentes. In 1994, she wrote a PhD dissertation on the, the decompilation process, and, which you can see, and see up here, and it's basically all of the tools follow her process. You know, there's been improvements in different stages of it, but every, all of the decompiler research, everybody says, you know, we, we owe everything to Christina's original uh, doctoral dissertation. Um, so th just quickly, the way these things work is they, they take the, the binary code, they lift it to an intermediate representation, um, and then and they, they each kind of have their own intermediate representation. 
They reconstruct the, the control flow graph and the data flow graph of the, of the function. And that gives them like a high level uh, abstract, abstract syntax representation of the function. They all sort of work on a, a function or subroutine level. Um, and, then they, and then they use that abstract representation to output the final code. The thing of it is, um, you know, from a practical perspective, decompilers always output blank code, right? So reverse engineers, um, you know, we spend a lot of time staring at, we used to spend a lot of time staring at assembly code. Now we can spend a lot of time staring at blank decompiled code, which is a little bit better, but it's not really fundamentally changing the speed at which we reverse engineer things. We still have to kind of stare at, all, at, at it a lot. It takes a long time to kind of uh, understand what's going on. It still takes a lot of training to really get what's going on uh, you know, inside a binary. Uh, so that the, the other kind of solved problem is function matching. So that's like where you have a function and you, that you've, you've either analyzed before or it's a library. So sometimes, you know, uh, sometimes people take open source libraries like say OpenSSL and then they integrate it into their, their code. And so these are tools that help when you know the, uh, you know a library is there, you can, or, or you have kind of code that you've already reverse engineered, you can match it up to the, to the code that you're, to the new code that you're looking at. Um, and um, these, uh, you know, they, they work fairly well um, in, in most um, use cases. There's kind of improvements that could be made to them, but, um, uh, you know, they, they work pretty well for, for um, you know, kind of day-to-day -day reverse engineering. Um, I forgot to mention too, so I'll, I'll put out my slides after this and um, you can see that I've, I've got everything kind of um, references all the way through. So you can certainly check out the slides and, um, you know, check all this out later. Um, they sort of all work in the same, uh, way they take the, the basic blocks of the function and then they, they take some signature of that, which is like lo lossy compression, so converting the bits and bytes within a basic block into a, a, into a hash or, or some compressed representation, and then doing, doing basically a graph match, uh, you know, but, so taking the control flow of, the, of two graphs and, and matching them that way. Um, then they'll also kind of go back out one one level up to the to the um, to like the the function to function call graph and um, and 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 compare the two that way. Um, point point is that you know they they work pretty well and you know we we should keep we should keep working on decompiler research. We should keep working on function matching research, but we're not going to you know, incremental improvements there aren't going to make a fundamental breakthrough in the speed of reverse engineering. That's sort of my, uh, my argument. Okay, so what are the gaps between the, our solved problems and our existing process? So how do we do reverse engineering? How do reverse engineers uh, operate? And what are the gaps between the tooling and our existing process? Um, when you ask people, uh, you know, what is software reverse engineering? Um, most people, you know, software reverse engineers get this, this, uh, this brilliantly artful PowerPoint uh, diagram in their head, um, you know, where they're like, okay, so we stare at this assembly and then, I don't know, we kind of understand it. You know, we stare at it for a while and then eventually, you know, light bulb and we, we kind of figure it out and we, we know. Um, so I, I try to think about our process as, as somebody at, at APL that kind of, I'm constantly kind of consulted to think, you know, people saying like, how do we make this process faster? You know, what, what, is, the, what is the process anyway? So I've kind of thought about this a lot. Um, I would argue that reverse engineers, when they're um, analyzing code, that they work on at least five levels. And so this, 
the, um, kind of represented in the diagram here. So we start out looking at, um, you know, st start out looking at assembly code, um, and then we kind of and we kind of work our way up to levels of abstraction till we kind of understand the the higher level functionality of a piece of code, right? So, you, you know, at the lowest level, we're looking at, uh, you know, disassembly opcodes. We start to look at the, um, at, you know, sort of a, a, a high level construct, like, you know, if then statements, for loops, that kind of stuff. Um, and we, we go up to a, a function level, right? So, you know, we're, we're familiar with l looking at, at subroutines, functions. Functions are then grouped into libraries, so then we have, okay, th this set of functions is, you know, these are related and these, this set of functions does something different, they're all within this binary. And then finally, once we get all that figured out, at, at the top level, we can then say, okay, what, what, are the pieces, what are the pieces of code, the main, you know, in, in our RTOS environment, that's usually like the user-defined threads that are doing the main functionality. You know, if it's, if it's malware, you might be, you know, you might have your, your main threads of, of uh, you know, of, of execution that are calling into all those, you know, all, all those libraries, all those areas of code underneath. So that's kind of the areas that we operate in. We, we are, we constantly are bouncing back and forth, uh, right? So we, we, we're not, you know, it's, it's not, it's not a linear process, right? We're, we're digging into, you know, one function, looking at some, some, opcodes saying, okay, this is, you know, this is adding something. Okay, I see this is adding up all the numbers in this buffer. And then, you know, then we're saying, oh, okay, so that means that this, uh, you know, th this function is a checksum function. And then if I, you know, bounce up even higher, that means, okay, they're, you know, they're, they're pulling, I can see at the top level, they're pulling out the payload and checking the checksum or, or whatever. So we're, we're constantly kind of bouncing back and forth, but what we're doing at each level is we're translating from code into natural language, right? We're, we are looking at opcodes and we're making, you know, comments about what the opcodes are doing. You know, at the function level, we're, we're saying, you know, okay, this is, uh, you know, this is what this function does, this is what this subroutine does. And eventually, when we get up to the top, you know, so if you're a malware uh, reverser, when you get up to the top, you can say, oh, okay, I finally understand how this thing works. I understand the components and the general flow. I can write my report, you know. Maybe for us, it's the same thing. You know, it's okay, I can, I've, I've decomposed it. I can write my report. You know, for us, it might be, I've, I've, I understand the general flow, and now I can target one particular area for vulnerability analysis. Um, but that's kind of the, that's really what we're doing in software reverse engineering. So we're, we're bouncing back and forth between these la layers of abstraction, working our way up, but we're translating, you know, into natural language at each stage. Um, and so when I think about this, you know, there's a lot of people because reverse engineering is so hard. It's it's a difficult, um, you know, it's it it's a difficult process. It's a it's a thing that requires a lot of training. It requires a lot of layered skills. So like skills you pick up doing one thing and you kind of add, add on. Um, and because of that, there's a lot of, there's, there's folks out there who are like, maybe we can just get rid of software reverse engineers altogether. Maybe we can just like take them out of the loop. Um, I don't think that's a very realistic goal. Um, but I'd like to think of it as what, what can we do to make reverse engineering accessible to more people? What can we do so that it's not so, it's not a thing where I have to have multi, all these levels of training to even kind of, you know, get started in it. Um, you know, how, how do we make it so that, uh, that we, and, and not to say that we, we won't have highly skilled people doing it, but how can, I, how can I just make there be tools so that people with, with less training can do it and people with you know, more training can do their job faster? Um, so that's, that's kind of how I, I kind of think about our current situation, I guess. Um, so what kind of problems should we work on next? My argument is basically, 
to make software reverse engineering faster, we need, to, we need tools that provide, um, provide information to an analyst in natural language, right? We, we need to kind of, we can speed up the, the, the process that we have, which is essentially a code and natural language translation problem by, by developing tools that, that do pieces of that problem in an, in an automated way. Um, so this is a set of, this is a set of challenge problems um, that I would like to see, um, kind of that I would like to see research done in. And I'm, I'm interested in doing, um, you know, research in, and I've already sort of put kind of a set of um, proposals together on. And so this is kind of um, just ideas for, um, you know, problems I'd, I'd like to see next. Um, first one is variable name prediction. So, so I've got to remember I said it. So when we when we decompile a function, we get a blank, you know, C function out. Um, the idea is, given this blank decompiled function, predict the variable names within that within that function based on code that you've seen before. Um, this is actually one of the areas that's being actively worked on. It's really really cool. I actually had to update these slides this week because um, this, this reference right here, number 19, uh, the, the um, CMU actually just came out with a new paper where they, they uh, claimed, I want to say 74% of the variable names they're able to, in, just kind of within their data set, within their, the experiment they did, they were able to recover and, and predict. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool. I think you're going to start to see tools that do that. They're they're working on a um, an IDA Pro plugin. I think they're planning to work on it for Ghidra. So you're, I think you're going to start to see that uh, out there soon. Um, another one: uh, statement commenting. So the I idea would be if you have you know uh, have decompiled code, um, put in auto-generated comments for it, right? Um, you know, look at what, what the, the basic blocks are doing. Um, you know, give, give me a meaningful, con if I've got an if then statement or I've got a for loop, give me a meaningful comment that's saying, you know, this is checking a, this, this is checking the state of the serial port and, or, you know, this, this for loop is iterate, iterating over all of the, uh, all of the bytes in a buffer or something like that. Um, give me give me some meaningful uh, natural language text for for each statement in a function. Um, but so and you, you'll you'll see these challenge these problems are kind of moving up those la layers of abstraction that I talked about. So um, function summarization um, at, at at a function level, you know, give, given a decompiled function output. Just a summary of that function and and what it's doing. Um, summarization is actually a difficult. If you talk to natural language processing people, summarization is kind of a difficult problem anyway. Um, if if you're familiar with uh, uh, if you're familiar with like Google Translate, so you know the way that they train Google Translate is they have things like uh, BBC articles where somebody wrote an article in English and then hand translated it to another language. So you've got a very high fidelity translation and then you can train on those things. Summarization is difficult to train on because you don't have a data set. Um, there, there aren't big data sets of things where somebody has hand summarized a, you know, an article or something like that. Um, it'd be cool, you know, I don't know if they could do train on cliff notes or something. Um, so that's a difficult problem anyway. Um, but so so imagine if you can get you get some natural language output of kind of what the pieces of this function are doing, and then you can summarize that and output a coherent statement about you know you know about what that um, function is doing. There is existing research in source code summarization, um, mainly for it that that mainly exists for sort of like auto commenting. So they're like. Um, People that do research on like if I take source code that somebody writes and then I just want to have it auto commented, um, 
you know, because my developers are lazy and they don't want to write comments or something. Um, but that's, that, that's out there, so maybe we can kind of build on that and if we get enough information, enough natural language information about the function from the, the other pieces, you know, maybe we can come up with a coherent summarization. Um, next one, so, something, I call, um, something I call the code cut problem, and this is the one that I've, I've worked on um, myself, so you can, you can check out my, um, uh, my GitHub repo is uh, reference 27 there. Um, and we've come up with sort of a preliminary solution to the problem. The idea is, so given I've got a binary, and generally what, you know, the way that large binaries work is you've got different source files that get compiled into object files and then they all get link linked together. And then all that information about the object files and where their boundaries were gets removed. So the idea is given a, a binary, locate the original object file boundaries within that binary to give an idea of, you know, this is a, this is a cluster of related functions, this is a cluster of related functions. Um, and so we've got a kind of a solution that does that, um, you know, okay, it, 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 uh, um, it kind of works. Um, so um, that's definitely something I, I'd love for, you know, more people to check out and, and um, uh, you know, the, the idea there, so if you, if you think about that and, and think about the summarization idea, if you're, if you're able to take a, a large binary and you're able to find those clusters of functionality, and then you're able to output text for each of the functions in that, uh, you know, in that object, in that cluster related functions, if you can, that you, you know, ideally you can then summarize it and then say, okay, this set of related functions is, you know, crypto related, or this stuff is a particular, you know, this is stuff is a particular SCADA protocol, or, you know, uh, what you know, what what have you? Um, this this is the this these are the standard library functions. Um, we kind of do that in with CodeCut. So CodeCut currently it kind of does it in a sort of simple, naive way. It just sort of looks for any string references within that within that object, and it will try to like look for common words and stuff like that. So if it finds like common, you know. Uh, words or common sets of words and it will we'll try to try to name your your uh, library based on that um, but that would be really cool because at that point um, the cool part with code cut is if you get a, a high fidelity solution there that's where your architecture your software architecture comes in because if you can if you can um, if you can identify those functional boundaries within the thing within your code you can then map you know, any time that this, this module of code interacts with this module of code and um, you do that throughout your binary and you, you pull out a, um, a, an architecture diagram. So CodeCut actually do, does that, um, you know, it does that right now. But so imagine you can get to a point where you get a software architecture diagram and it's well labeled in, um, you know, in, in natural language. That'd be really cool. Uh, some f just quickly some foundational work. Um, the, this is kind of in, in uh, natural language processing, they call it word embeddings, which is basically the process of taking the, you know, the, your corpus of words and mapping it into a vector space so that you can do, you know, you can do reasoning on it. There's, there's been a couple of projects on mapping um, uh, assembly code and high level code in, into um, in, in doing that, that embedding so that you can do reasoning on it. So I think that those um, code to vec just came out. I think it was like they did, they did the research last year. So um, that's kind of foundational work that people should be able to build on, um, which is pretty cool. Okay, so quickly, so those are, those are the, the problems. And so how do we get started? Um, the 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 way that we get started um, in and the way that I sort of decided to get started on the problem was collecting data. Um, I started to talk to people at work, kind of machine learning folks, and they said, 
you know, uh, they said, well, you have, um, you know, you, you want to do this machine learning stuff. You've got labeled data, right? That's what we do. You know, we, we, we take, you know, we train on well-labeled data and we kind of make algorithms that, that work with that. And, and uh, I said, well, you know, I thought about it. I said, actually, no. Um, the, the um, we have a ton, of, there's a ton of open source code out there and there's a ton of, uh, there's a ton of firmware out there, um, you know, binary firmware. Um, but there's almost no z debugging symbols, right? So most of the time, you know, when you build production code, you, you don't have, you don't get your, people don't publish the, the symbols. They don't publish artifacts from the compile process, right? And so in order to do meaningful research here, we need code um, compiled, you know, with, uh, and, and we need to save the compile artifacts while we're, uh, you know, while we're compiling the code and save the binaries, save the symbols, and kind of publish that all as a data set. Um, ideally, from, for my research, ideally it would be cross-architecture, right? If we, we've got so many things out there that work on in, you know, Intel code, but you know, we port, and maybe it works for ARM because of phones, but if we port it to you know, the next architecture, or we just can't port it to the next architecture, it's kind of purpose written for those architectures or whatever. So ideally, I, I would like to have a you know, data set that has many architectures in it, so it doesn't just get overtrained on Intel code. Um, yeah, okay, so I created this thing called AllStar. Um, AllStar is a data set um, that we're planning to publish. It's currently building, um, and uh, it, it, we're, we're at about, uh, we're about two-thirds of the way through building it. Um, we're taking the Debian, uh, the Jesse distribution, uh, which is slightly older, but there's, there's a reason why we're doing that. And um, we're basically taking the 32,000 Debian packages. Debian theoretically builds for six architectures. So it theoretically builds for x86, 32, and 64, ARM, PowerPC, MIPS, and IBM S390. And uh, we're, we're using the DocCross um, project to build that, to basically Basically, all we're doing is iterating through all the packages and building them for all the architectures that Debian supports. Um, this is kind of the, the um, with Debian, we're able to sort of override the compiler flag so we can um, make it save that, that extra information that we want to. Um, I said it takes five to six weeks to build. It, like, once I get the, I think like subsequent, hopefully subsequent builds will take five to six weeks. I, I like hit, uh, hang-ups every, every once in a while, and I have to like, uh, you know, bas basically just, pa it's, it's pretty much just packages that, that aren't uh, well behaved, that either take some manual like configuration or something like that, so then I'd like remove them and, and you know, restart the, that, that build thread. So theoretically, I can, can, we can build, and on the setup we have about uh, 35 to 55 packages an hour. Um, so this is the what it's going to look the, like. I said the build's currently in currently in process, but we're planning to have it released by the by the end of the year. Um, it'll end up being about a terabyte of storage, and it'll so it'll, it'll end up with about 160,000 64-bit binaries, um, and about 20,000 binaries that are that build across all six architectures. Um, that's pretty decent. Um, some of the other research that was out there, you know, the, like this, the CMU research and stuff, they're working off of about 20,000 GitHub binaries. Um, so this is actually, actually pretty decent. Um, and if, if you want to just do 64-bit, it's a 64-bit x86, it's, it's um, really good. Um, so kind of... Uh, the, the sort of why, why we did it this way, the, the, um, there's, um, you know, some, some of the other papers that are out there are using a GitHub approach, which is basically just like try to suck down as much as you can off of GitHub and, and build it all. Um, 
And so this is my argument for why, why use Debian versus, versus GitHub. Um, GitHub has more packages, theoretically. Um, so the th theoretically, like 400,000 packages that are in C. Um, the, the, the problem with that is um, a couple of these projects have actually found that there's up to 70% duplication in GitHub, you know, so you think like there's repos that are just, that are, that are just cloned, but there's also just like copy and pasted, you know, code. So somebody copies and pastes some open source code into, you know, into their repo. And um, so I, I don't, I don't know, you know, maybe there's more original code out there on, on GitHub, but it's probably not a lot more than what's in Debian. Um, the GitHub approach is you basically just try to run, configure, and make. You know, there's no standard way to build a GitHub package, right? And generally, that just sort of works for 64-bit x86 because that's what everybody's running on their PC, um, you know. And you, you, presumably, you can try running it in, say, like, in a, in a Windows environment, a Linux environment, maybe a Mac OS environment. I, th I think they generally run in a Linux environment, but... Um, I'm not sure. So it's, I think it's a lot less likely, the GitHub stuff is a lot less likely to build cross-architecture. Um, the licensing, there's, there's a problem with GitHub. So in GitHub you can, you can label your project with a license. You, know, you can say this is GPL code or something else. Um, but there's no way to like, check it, I guess. Um, and if you don't choose to label it, uh, which is a lot of, the, a lot of them, you know, aren't necessarily labeled with a license, um, then kind of how you share it and how you, you know, just legally it's, it's kind of non, not obvious, um, you know, what is allowed there. So a lot, of, a lot of people are like sharing data sets from GitHub that are like, um, you know, they're, they're just code or they're fragments of code. Um, the cool part is with Debian, it's all GPL'd, so we can build it all and we can share those, we can, Share those binaries, publish those binaries, um, and you know legally it's all it's all good. I'd also like to think I'd like to think that Debian has a little you know on average the code is a little bit more like serious or polished. Um, you know I'm not going to make a strong argument there. You know GitHub, you know you got stuff where people just kind of they write something. You know um, you know most people or I shouldn't say most people a lot of people just have their own GitHub repo where they kind of like play around with stuff, hack on it. So I'd like to think that Debian, you know, in general, is a little bit more polished code on average. Um, this is kind of, you can check this out later, you know, kind of if you're interested in working with this, um, you know, what's, what's in it. And it, basically we're, we're taking um, a binary and for each source file um, we're, we're outputting Sort of the abstract syntax represent, representation from GCC, and the uh, the register transfer language, uh, which is kind of like that the final internal representation in GCC, and then the object file. Um, if that binary's got a man page, we're saving it. Symbols in the binary, and then any um, any header files that the file that it uses, any system libraries. We also the cool part too is we're also um, we're, we're cloning, you know, we completely cloned the Debian Jesse repository. So even when Debian isn't using that anymore, we'll keep that, you know, around. So you'll always be able to kind of pull those uh, source packages. Um, and then we make it browsable, you know, so it'll be browsable by HTML and have a JSON index for, um, you know, for code parsing. This is just a picture of what it looks like. Thanks to my uh, my buddy Mark for making us the the sweet logo, um, and and pretty uh, pretty looking HTML. Um, yeah, so I mentioned we're planning to get that out there at the end of the year, and uh, we've got some internal research projects that are planning on using it, and we're, we've started to try to work on um, on uh, on some different. Pro proposals out there with our government sponsors to do more research in this area. Hoping to see, um, a, you know, a lot more research in this area. Um, please, if you, you know, if you're interested in 
doing research with us or um, you know interested in funding us, absolutely, uh, you know, come come talk to me. Um, and yeah, that's all. That's all I got. Um, I, w I would like to say, uh, uh, I'd like to thank everybody. First of all, th thank thankful to my folks in uh, management at APL, um, in my, my line management for all the, the reviews and working on this. Um, folks in my program management that, that funded our research. Um, I'm also uh, um, uh, especially thankful to, to Halvar Flake, whom many of you know, uh, formerly of uh, Google Project Zero. He was actually like uh, really awesome about like brainstorming with me on All Star and um, gave me a lot of encouragement to, to do it. So I really appreciate that. And um, Igor uh, Hoshian and uh, Joan kind of helped me track down some of the uh, the 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 resources and references that are that are uh, in here. So I wanted to thank them as well. Um, and I think Chris, I think I got time for questions. Okay. Um, I got a question in the back. Uh, how can you, did you say how can you hear about it when it's finished? Yeah. Yep. Uh, so good question. You can follow me on Twitter. Um, I'm, I have, the, I, th I think we decide our official hashtag is the, is all star data set. So if you want to, you want to look for that or follow me on, on Twitter, I'll, I'll, um, uh, uh, you know, I, and I'll basically tweet out when it's when it's done. Given your focus on embedded systems, why did you choose to do a whole operating system user space as opposed to multiple OS kernels? Uh, that was a really good question. The question was, given my focus on uh, real-time operating systems, why choose to do a, you know, Debian, which is basically, you know, it's a, uh, you know, general purpose, you know, operating system and, and a bunch of user space binaries. Um, the, the reason is there isn't anything that's quite like that, and, and I'd love to kind of brainstorm it more, there isn't quite anything quite like that in the RTOS space. There are some RTOSs that, that are, um, uh, that that are like cross architecture. Um, one of the one of the ones I looked at is uh, Free RTOS. The problem is that they they don't necessarily have a, a consistent like Free RTOS it, in particular didn't have a consistent um, build process, you know, across the different architectures, and and it's also a question of then the the volume of code that you would get. Um, I, really good question. I would love for there to, to be such a thing. And I could see us doing like, um, you know, ha doing, uh, you know, finding data sets like that. That would, I think that might be a good place where, you know, if you get kind of a initial thing working and then you would, you know, evaluate it on a smaller R RTOS focused data set, um, I think that would be nice. So yeah, that's sort of my thinking on that. Any other questions? You w raise your uh, hand or shout loudly. All right, cool. Thanks, everybody.